In this episode, I have a Sony CCD TRV 128. This is a high 8 camcorder, one of the last, I would think, of the high 8 camcorders that Sony made. And uh, this one here apparently has a problem, it's not playing tapes. And it looks like the mechanism itself could have a bit of a problem too, it's not closing properly. Let's uh, take a look at this one that was sent up from a viewer. I have a Sony Handycam High 8 that was sent up from a viewer in, down in California that uh, saw some of my Handycam videos and has one that's not working. This one's a CCD TRV128 and apparently it's not playing tapes. So I'm going to take a look at this and we'll open this one up and see if I can get this one going. It's incredible how much it costs to ship something like this. It costs them like $58 and change to ship this uh, little camcorder. Probably more than the camcorder's worth just in shipping charges to get it to me. And they still got to pay to get it back too. So shipping charges on this, like everything, is a lot higher than what the actual cost of the repair is going to end up being. I'm just going to remove the, the strap here just to make it a little easier to work with and then we'll uh, test this out. Now I got an old tape, very old tape, because I did, haven't shot in high 8 for a while, but I was going through my old box of tapes. Yes, I kept every tape, or pretty much every tape that I ever uh, ever did. I found somebody's wedding, so I won't be able to show uh, uh, too much of the shots of what's on the tape, but it's one that was done on my old, um, I think this, forget which one this was shot with. Oh, you know what? Well. I don't even know whose wedding this is, but part of the wedding is my brother-in-law's. I shot his. I guess I could show shots from that. But uh, there's some other stuff on there on the tape that was pre-existing. Um, on the tape, I, re I reused another tape that I had used probably years ago for somebody else's wedding. And I, when I shot weddings, I only typically used the tapes once for shooting a client's wedding. And then once I had edited the tape, and it was all edited over onto digital, uh, I reused the the eight millimeter tapes for less important stuff. I only actually did, made one recording on it, and I never reused the tape for anybody else. And this is one that has somebody else's stuff on there on the tail end of the tape. We'll use that as a playback reference, though, just because I know that the alignment on this is correct. So if I have to do an alignment, I can use this as a reference to do that. Okay, let's see. This thing here, we turn it on by pressing the mode button it has a little uh, black and white viewfinder, one of those little tubes I guess, Maybe, oh this one might be an LCD actually well is that an LCD or a tube? it's pretty small for a tube I would think this one's an LCD but it's a, it's a black and white one ah, definitely a black and white, little black and white screen but it looks to be an LCD because if that was a CRT, that would be awfully small. It does have the flip-out LCD screen, and we can see that the camera part works because I've got a picture. But uh, from what I understand, the problem with this is the mechanism. So let's uh, load the tape up. So I'll press the button down here a second time. That will change this over to playback. And then... camera opens so let's see whether this thing will play anything play I don't see a picture let's get that menu off the screen now the counter is moving, so we know the tape is actually moving. And uh, now this one doesn't have a door on the side where you can actually see it either. But there's no picture. What if I try to search? Where's my search buttons on this? Pause. Oh, interesting. We have a picture on pause. Ah, we have a picture on fast forward with black bars in it. Huh. I have a picture on rewind with black bars. Almost looks like one of the heads is not outputting a signal. 
interesting. Uh, this could be a dirty head or it could be a, a bad connector. Uh, let's um, open this thing up and see what uh, what it's doing. So I'll take the tape out again. Ah, tape seemed to almost stick there momentarily. Okay, let's open this camera up and um, see what it's doing. Now, I've never opened up one of these specific models before. Worked on lots of cameras, but I've never opened up one of these. But I'm going to start removing some of the arrow mark screws, and that should get me into this thing. I believe this was like a 2004 model, and I left the service business in 2003. Most of the ones I've worked on have the mechanism the other way around where the tape goes down from the top. This is one of those dumb ones where the tape came up from the ejected to the bottom, which is, I thought this was one of the dumber designs that Sony uh, actually did. They copied JVC's design. Because you see, what's wrong with this picture, okay? So you've got the camera mounted on a tripod, and now you need to, you know, you got your, your tripod base mounted on here, and now you need to change the tape. So you gotta take the camera off the tripod, you gotta unscrew the, the, the shoe that fits onto the tripod just to open it up to change the tape and then put it all back on. I, I didn't like this design. I thought it was kind of a silly a silly way of doing things but I guess they did it for a reason. It must have made something a little cheaper. So there's the top cover off that exposes the the ribbon cables here and the uh, the heads and the top part of the mechanism here with the loading guides. So now I'll be able to put the battery on, load the tape again, and we can watch what this thing does when it threads up. So battery back on. And I'll open up the tape compartment, and that'll start the ejection mechanism. And there it goes, it opens up. Probably take this door off too, make things a little easier to see. If I undo this one screw, this should I think that'll remove this door. And then we'll be able to see. And the hand grip's got to come off. Wonderful. Okay, now that lifts off. Okay, now we can see sort of what the mechanism does so we can watch this thing load and then when I oh this catch is a bit bent here it looks like if I open this up it should eject That's working fine. Looks like for starters, this catch is a bit bent here. You can see this catch is bent. So we'll straighten that out because what's happening, oops, I started the thing again. When you open this up all the way, it activates the switch. So we'll just close this down. I'm gonna take the battery off of it so that it doesn't try to eject when I do this. You see that this catch right here is bent. Sorry, I got the uh, I got the heat running in here right now because uh, it's a little bit cool out. So let's straighten this catch here. We'll just bend it back down. The nice thing about these thin metal parts is that they uh, 
they bend really easy back into place. Okay, now that works properly. I don't have to play with the door to get it to close. First thing I'm going to try doing is I'm just going to try cleaning the heads on this thing and I'm going to use my fingernail on this to try and clean it just because uh, that is uh, quite often adequate. Whereas the, uh, the other option would be to use a cleaning tape but that's usually quite abrasive so we'll try the good old uh, fingernail cleaning because I can access the head right up here while it's spinning and uh, Make sure my finger fingernails are clean and I don't have any dirt and stuff on them and we'll try that first. This has got a head cleaning wheel but they don't work that well as you can see. So we'll open the mechanism up. And I'm going to select play and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my clean fingernail and I'm just going to touch the outside of my fingernail against the, the head drum here as it's spinning and see whether the picture will improve because we may have a clogged head now before you anybody gets concerned that I'm going to damage the head uh, let me tell you something the head is a lot harder than your fingernail now you wouldn't do any use any tools or anything on this because that is a good way to damage the head but your fingernail itself is not going to damage the head itself but it will dislodge any uh, any material that might be uh, clogging it up 8 millimeter cameras used a metal tape so you can't use like Freon or alcohol or anything it's not going to dissolve a metal particle that is fused over the head the only way to clean 8 millimeter and DV heads was to use a dry cleaner or use the fingernail technique uh, dry cleaners work by rubbing the dirt off but of course when you use a dry cleaner you reduce the life of the heads every time you do it so you don't want to do it unless you have to you know if, if you can't get access to the the head itself but quite often you can just uh, you can just very lightly just put my finger here just very very lightly oh look there we go we had a clogged head isn't that something that's all it took to clear that off which is to very light like no pressure just very very lightly rest my finger until I can feel I'll turn off the heater so you can hear because you'll hear the head um, hitting my fingernail and that makes the heads clean believe it or not so here's a shot of the head and I just took my fingernail and that you'll hear it when I make contact so it's like that and that's all that's needed and that will remove any debris and I just use the back side of my fingernail not the edge here but just let it rust up against the back side here and that scrubs the head clean as you can see we had no picture before we have a picture now I don't know if there's anything else wrong with this camera other than the fact that it wasn't playing I have a feeling they have it they probably got a damaged tape that went through it and um, the damaged tape uh, contaminated the head see this is a this is a wedding that I did years ago. I got to keep the screen just tilted down so you guys can't really see who it is. I mean, this was done. I don't know when I did this tape. It was back when I was still using Hi8 as a as a shooting format. So that would have been uh, it would have been back in the '90s, I guess. I was shooting early '90s when I was shooting on Hi8 because I. I went to DV when DV came out in uh, the mid 90s. I switched over to DV. But everything else seems to be working on here. When I fast forward now, as you can see, if I go to fast forward, remember we had all the black bars there before? Now the picture looks normal. When I go to rewind or reverse search, everything's looking good. Alignment, alignment is looking good on here. Everything appears to be working properly. I just want to. Uh, go through the uh, the mechanism and we'll just eject the tape and make sure nothing's hanging up so if I pull that down release the catch and open this up yeah everything's looking good there nothing's catching
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put the covers back on. It would have been nice if I had to take a little more of it apart than this, but hey, at least I fixed the, uh, the, the catch was a bit bent. Actually, this one here looks like it's kind of a bit crooked too. Straighten that out. There. I think we're good. So really, all I had to do with this is straighten this catch that was, that was damaged and um, clean the heads. Everything else looks to be in good shape on this camera. And this is one that was made after they had all the big capacitor uh, problems, the, the capacitor plague. So uh, this is a little more modern in this camera, so that shouldn't uh, be an issue on this one. Let's uh, put the thing together, and then we'll, I'll make a test recording, and we'll, we'll try it out and make sure that all the features work. And then this one's going to go back into the mail and get sent back to the owner. And uh, as I say, it's going to cost them a lot more in freight than it actually costs to repair it. It's shipping uh, these things back and forth is expensive. You know, it shouldn't be as much as it is, but unfortunately it's, you know, it, it cost them $59 to ship the thing to me and it'll probably cost that much to go back. So, you know, $120 in shipping to basically to clean the heads and, uh, and fix a catch. And had head cleaning tape still been available, they could have picked up a head cleaning tape and cleaned it. I think I got it. I'm not hooked in right here. But, but uh, the problem is, you can't get them anymore. They don't make the cleaning tapes anymore. They don't even make the cassettes anymore for these things. So the manufacturers really abandoned everybody and left everybody with an orphaned product. Oh, that's all right. I thought for a minute there that the, that the front uh, was not. Uh, properly secured, but it looks to be right. Incidentally, I, I learned about the fingernail uh, cleaning technique when I worked for Sony. They used to do that in the shop. They used to do exactly the same thing. It's almost like this one was designed with this removable hatch over top of the heads just to make it easy to get at to clean that way because uh, the other ones where the mechanism went out from the top and the heads were down at the bottom, you had to pull the side off the camera to get at it. This one here, you know, three screws and you're in like Flynn and uh, easy, to, easy to access that part. So it's almost like they designed this thing as a service point just to uh, pop out those screws. So... For anybody else that's got one of these cameras, if you've got no picture and you put it on fast forward or rewind or uh, pause and you get a partial picture, that's an indication that you've lost signal from one of the heads. Yes, it could be one of these cables, one of these uh, ribbon uh, connectors had come loose and I was thinking maybe that's what it was, was one of these ribbons had come loose here where it plugs into the board, but that wasn't the case. It was just a bad head, a dirty head, clogged head. And that goes on by pushing that forward and pushing it back like that. So hopefully this video will help any of you that have got one of these camcorders like this of this design, that uh, if you've got no picture, that's a way to clean the heads. And a way that's going to provide much less wear on the heads than putting in one of those dry cleaning tapes because, uh, yes, the dry cleaning tapes will work, but uh, the dry cleaning tapes are also going to take some of the life expectancy from the heads away because that's just how they work they work like a, a, a well they work like sandpaper they just basically sand off the dirt sand off the, the metal particles oh it still has a bit of a problem the uh, flap is not closing on the front of the tape which makes it stick a bit so I'll have to take the side off it again when it opens the flap the flap is supposed to close. Must be something. Must be something bent on here that's uh, just preventing that flap from closing, which holds the tape up a bit. When I try to eject it, see. 
so there's still a bit of an issue here I have to check that out it might be it might be uh, this is bent a bit so I'm just gonna pull this the side piece off again and just inspect that so once again I'll just I only get to remove this cover because it appears that it didn't do it when I had it apart so it might even be something pressing on the uh, the plastic here but when I put it together it uh, kind of hung up there so we'll just take this cover off I want to check this out it might be something bent in in here somewhere right that's what I'm thinking Hmm, it's not sticking now. Interesting. You see the door is opening and it's closing. Oh, that time it's stuck. It must be touching against something on the edges here. I'm just looking to see if I can spot it. You can hear it squeaking. That's, I think that's the uh, I think that's the, the uh, tape that here is it's opening and closing. It's rubbing. I think it's rubbing against the side and it's just catching it and holding it open. It's got to be one of these on the side here. Looks to me like it's right down here here where my finger is pointing right down there it looks to me like it's right there that it's that's um it's hung up there a bit maybe maybe this is slightly bent that that happens on these front mechanisms these are these loading mechanisms people get careless and they they uh you know things get bent tapes get jammed in and they get bent a bit There's a little, there's a little catch that pushes this tab here. This is what releases it. So there's a little catch here when you push the tape in that pushes this little lever over. That's the lock that locks the lid. And then, so that pushes that in. Then when you push the tape down, there's a little, there's a little um, on this side. There's a little um, like a cam that. Uh, It's a little black. It's, a, it's actually part of the dampening mechanism that slows the uh, cassette from popping up too quick. But this little black piece down inside here, down there, that little black piece, that's what actually makes contact with the with the edge of the tape here. So when the latch is released and the tape gets pushed down, that flips it open. But you see that the tape itself is spring loaded, so it will close on its own. I think maybe what happened was the tape got jammed. So the tape got stuck, maybe something was spilt on a tape or something. The tape got stuck inside the machine. So when, it, when the tape got ejected, there was tape hanging out here, which prevented the lid from closing. So the lid was actually held open by the tape. And uh, someone uh, pulled on the tape and maybe bent, maybe bent this mechanism, pulled it in a little bit, like, you know, from pulling on it. And that's why it's sticking a little bit. So let's see if I can just kind of, kind of try and straighten this up a bit. Weird. See, this this is spring closed by the actual tape itself. So why it's sticking open is it's got to be something squeezing the tape. You know, something that's squeezing this so that when it closes, it doesn't close all the way. That's what I'm thinking is when the lid closes, something is maybe squeezing on the side here, and as it closes. That flap stays open like that, you see? It's happening. 
I think the tape is being squeezed the front here a little bit and uh, normally it closes normally but if there's any if there's any tension pressed on here you see what happens is it doesn't close it stays open a bit and that's what's happening you see that back stays open on the on the cassette if there's any pressure so I think that's what's happening is that the, the mechanism may be slightly bent and it's just putting a bit of pressure on the front of the tape and just enough that it's uh, not closing the lid I think that's what the problem is it's just this front here is, is slightly bent in so if I can just kind of try to straighten this out and the fact that these clips on the bottom were bent maybe the camera was dropped that's quite a common occurrence with camcorders you know, nobody dropped their camera right that's something that never happened camcorders they were never dropped no it was the vcrs that were dropped and i'm not joking about that either because in the early days the shop i worked for we used to rent vcrs with movies and the number of vcrs that people brought back that got dropped either getting them into their house or bringing them back was unreal the number of machines i had to fix that somehow managed to get dropped happened all the time the biggest problem with camcorders was people taking them to the beach the number of camcorders i'd get that had sand in them was just unreal you know they take the camera to the beach or they take it on a, out in a boat and get water into it that was the big killer for camcorders that's uh, like used to see them all the time with dirt or sand in the gears and in the mechanism you know say oh we didn't take it out on the beach really how did that sand get in there I see nothing that's touching that uh, that lid. I don't see any marks on here from where it's been rubbing. Other than I think maybe it's just squeezing the end of the cassette a little bit too tight. Which could indicate a bent mechanism, slightly bent mechanism. See, if it's open when it's flat, like this, it closes properly each and every time. It's only if I do it at an angle. If I hold it at an angle like this, sometimes it won't close all the way. There, like that. And of course, then if you go to pull the tape out, the tape could stick unless you wiggle it a bit. If, it, if I get it to do it, now if I try to pull the tape out, what happens is the tape gets stuck like that. If you push it back in and remove it, it's fine. But it's just that if this, if this little flap is sticking up like this, it catches. When you go to pull the tape out, it catches up against the mechanism. It catches up against a couple of little uh, um, flaps that hold the tape down in place. So then if you go forward with it and the lid closes, I, I think it's something squeezing the front here. That's what I, I, I still think it's the same thing. The mechanism itself is maybe a bit bent at the front. It doesn't look like it, but it could very well be have a slight warp in it gonna try and expand the outside a bit just a little bit bend this out just a little tiny bit because I think that's what's happening is it's it's just catching it's just a little too snug and it's holding this see and then the cassette you don't have to put much pressure on these tapes just a very very slight pressure 
and this will open. I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I don't want to bend this mechanism. Like I don't want it really. I don't want to put any undue stress and bending in the metal because it's very very thin and it, and it, the um, the tolerances are quite are quite critical. So if you bend it, it's not going to work. So I don't really want to put too much pressure on here. I just want to try and make sure that it closes. And it seems like it's closing most of the time now. I think if they if they're careful with this thing, and just remember that if the tape seems to stick just to wiggle it a bit and it'll come out. Now that latch works like it did before. Eject and it closes and the tape comes out. I think I'm going to leave it at that because it's about as good as it's going to get. And um, to say I don't want to, uh, I don't want to damage it because there's no parts available for these things. So if you bugger up the mechanism, you're you're basically screwed. Yeah, let's see here. So now we'll take this thing and load a new tape in it and uh, do some recording and take a look at the, uh, the picture off this. Check this out. I tell you, I was a high-end videographer. I had a Steadicam. Isn't that cool? I was shooting with a Steadicam back in the 90s. That's a Steadicam Junior. This would have been shot on a VX3, a CCD VX3 3 chip. But that was, uh, yeah, I was, that's, that was done with a Steadicam. That's why it's so, so smooth, the uh, shots. What I'm going to do to do the recording, I'm going to grab a brand new tape. I've got a brand new Hi8 tape, and I'll put that in here. We're going to take this thing out, and I'm going to do a little bit of shooting just around the town here with it, just handheld. And then we'll bring the tape back. I'm going to take the AV outputs and the S output from this. I'll plug it into my capture card, and we'll play it back from this camera, and I'll drop it in. And I won't uh, stretch the picture, so it'll be a, obviously a small picture. Um, I guess I could. I could resize it. But you'll see what the quality off of what this camera, what it was capable of shooting when it was still current. So let's go take it out and take some pictures. Getting a ticket. Because of course, we have stupid laws here in where I live that uh, says no handheld electronic devices. And even though this is not a handheld electronic device, it's still a camera and the cops might give me a ticket for this. So I'm just driving down the road here, just filming out the front window and uh, not looking at the camera, keeping my eyes on the road. I'm just kind of pointing it and hoping that nobody will see me coming the other way, holding a camera in my hand. So we're making this recording in, uh, I think it's in high eight mode. I didn't even look to see. I guess I should double check that, make sure it's in high eight when I pull over. But we're just driving down the road here, filming out the window on an analog tape format, yuck. I did just double check and we are indeed in high eight. I set this thing up on my dash, so I'm not having to hang on there. Now I'm not technically touching it, I'm just letting it rest on my dash and uh, record. It's kind of a gloomy day out today. It's uh, January the 2nd and uh, it's about almost 9 degrees Celsius out right now. So while the rest of the country is you know, minus 30, minus 40, 
we're plus eight. Kind of like it out here on the west coast. Or we, what we like to call it, the left coast. Dead ahead is the beach. If you're wondering why the sound is only coming out of one channel, well, this apparently is a monaural camera. I thought all the hi eights were stereo, but I was proven wrong once again. This is a monaural camera. So we only get sound out of one channel. Also, we get this crappy picture. This is what standard definition looks like, unless you resize it. So we can, that's, that's, that's full resolution off this camera. Let's uh, resize this thing so you guys can see um, how it looks when blown up to 1920 by 1080. Let's see how this does the job. See, I'm not looking at the camera, I'm just kind of pointing it out the side window. In this case, though, the window's down. Some nice mansions along here on the golf course. Now I captured this directly from the S video out and the audio out from this little camcorder, the, uh, the TRV-128 that I just repaired. I shot it with this camera, I'm playing it back with the camera, and I'm capturing this using the GB-HD 700, which is a full uh, broadcast quality uh, capture board in this. It sends it out on Firewire at 720 by 480 interlaced, which is the full resolution for DV quality or DV video digitized from the analog input. So this is the best quality you're going to find off of a, a standard definition analog tape capturing it this way. Transferred straight over firewire wise but again it's only 720 by 480 and we're resizing it up to 1920 by 1080. Um, that's as good as standard definition looks unfortunately when you resize it to show in HD. Um, this is what we had to deal with back in the early 2000s before uh, we got high definition. But this camcorder appears to be working fine. It's recording and it's playing fine. Uh, no problems. Looks like there's a bit of dirt on the lens there. As you actually can see it. There is dirt on the lens, but again, that's how it arrived. I didn't clean it or anything. I just fixed the problem with it and uh, we'll clean the lens and send it back to its owner and it'll make the return trip down to uh, California where it came from. And they'll be happy. They'll be able to transfer their tapes over to DVD or onto their computer and do whatever else they need to do with it. Anyway, that's it. It's done. It's fixed. Thanks for watching, and we will uh, catch you again in the next one real soon.